Hi guys, it's my Friday live from um, the parking lot while my granddaughter and daughter are at their doctor's appointment. My granddaughter's weekly um, physical and occupational appointments. So today I'm not opening a jewelry box, sadly, um, but I am opening a jewelry related box. This one is a book I ordered and I do order these from Goodwill and other places. Um, to get them cheaper because I like the coffee table books and they're very expensive. And then the ones about jewelry or collecting, they all get really expensive. So this one, ooh, costume jewelry. This one, um, let me, I'm gonna hold you this way for just a sec. Okay. Okay, paid uh, $23.05 for it and it is costume jewelry collection and it's the hardcover um so i'm excited about that oh, look at this original price was 18.99 <laughs> it's just ridiculous that these collector guys cost that much but they do and goodwill was nice enough to put thank you Kristen on it um it took forever to get it so uh, hold on i just don't want you to Oh, this says I ordered it through Amazon. Oh, so the, yeah, this says Amazon right there. So this wasn't my Goodwill one. This was the Amazon one. And this is a um, visual reference and price guide. That's a brooch right there. But I, I think Trafari did that brooch. I'm going to have you looking up just a second. Let me get this off. Okay. Woohoo. So... Why I love these books. Well, I was an art major, so I do love big, obnoxious books. Shall we read? I should have like a shoulder cam thing here. So this one um, gives you designer profiles, which is nice because you learn. And, the, and then they do the A to Z here. And I like that. And then they also have a gallery of unsigned pieces. And um, those are nice because if you're um, collecting and or reselling, things like that are nice to have. So let me open up a page here. Oh, Weiss. Weiss is one of my faves. He made, um, well, jewelry but and from Germany. But um, um, oh, he was, he was from Germany, but he, he opened his company after he immigrated to the United States um, in 1942. It's right there. Um, so, let's see. He owned his company. He opened it in New York City in 42, and in 1971 it closes. So that's nice to know. You already have your, if you find a piece that says Weiss on the back, you now know it dates between 42 and 71, which is a great way. Um, so you have a starting point, which is always nice. Um, Weiss's stuff tends to be made out of glass from Germany, obviously, but, um, some Swarovski. And then he, in the fifth, um, when they released AB, Swarovski released it to the general population or the, you know, um, I think it was a 59 or so. So he did that too. Um, Hollycraft did, con he ha contracted with Hollycraft. Um, to make some of his stuff as his demands grew in the um, 50s and 60s. So that's kind of good to know. So he didn't produce all him. Things I collect, um, I love, well, of course, I'm a big lover of anything that sparkles, but I always collect um, enamel pens, pens, brooches. And then, um, let's see. I love um, circle ones. Good, better, best. So, who is this? Okay. Good, better, best. Oh, it's talking about Haskell. Okay. And that's true. Every, um, not every, but most costume places have the good, better, excuse me, best pricing. So, Monet or whatever, they have that. Um, if you're there. Hey, guys. I don't know if I wave. It's not a... It's alive from my car as I wait for my granddaughter, um, who's at physical and occupational therapy. These are about Miriam Haskell, which her pieces started out as one of a kind. 
and most of them still remain that way. Um, and she made them, but she used very nice things. I did not know she was born before the turn of the century. See, this, this book's nice. This book is the um, Collector's Edition by Judith Miller, who writes a lot of these. Um, it's the Costume Jewelry um, Reference and Price Guide. I think this was from 2003 or four. Um, and I got it used. I buy a lot of these books used because even used, I pay 20, not quite $25 for it. So, um, it's, you know, difficult. Um, let's see. Um, Marian Haskam died in 81 and she was born in 1899. Wow. What a life she led. She got to see just about everything. Um, she didn't start trademarking her jewelry into the 40s. So if you see a trademark sign on any of her jewelry, you know that it's from 40s or later. Um, and, oh, I didn't know she had Frank Hess was one of the ones that worked for her. Let's see. So she was 25 years old when she moved to New York and opened a shop in a hotel, McAlpin Hotel. And then in 26, so two years later, she opened a full-fledged company. So that's kind of cool. I don't have, I don't think I have any Haskell. Joan, that's Joan Crawford. She must have worn one of Miriam's. And why am I going backwards? I don't know. Oh, Hobe. I like Hobe. Um, I learned about Hobe in college in my jewelry class because it was founded by a Jew, um, like a, a master goldsmith, I think is what they call him. I don't know. Let me see here. 1887 to present. In 1887, the original Hobe C, C I E, um, I don't know. I'm not, I can't pronounce French, <laughs> um, is founded in Paris by the master goldsmith Jacques Hobe. Um, his son, William, which is who I studied. Um, began selling theatrical costume jewelry, which is what I originally had learned about before I even learned about his dad and being a goldsmith. And then um, in 27, 1927, they founded an American Hobe. And then um, in 1980s, William Hobe's grandson, James, continued production. I'm not sure if they're still... Well, they were as 2003 when this was published. And they have great pieces. I mean, and the resale value is on them pretty good. This is from the 40s. Vermeil and sterling silver. That's because he did use um, a lot of sterling silver and then would coat it. Vermeil is... Or Vermeil. I mean, it depends. I, always, I learned to say it Vermeil. When I read it, I say Vermeil, even though I say Verme when I talk about it. And it's a certain percentage of gold over sterling. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head, goodness gracious. That was on one of my test questions. Um, but Hobe is known best for their floral pins that they produced in the 40s, I believe. So this is one of them. Um, that's floral from the 40s, but that's the pin up here. I would love to have that bracelet. Um, there's one of his. Um, oh, that one's one. And so, sorry, I started reading. The cameo is um, white on red, carved cameo from the 40s. Are you getting that picture? Great. Ooh -hoo. Um, and it was for May. And oh, it's unsigned. But that's five to six hundred dollars. So that was um, 17, 18 years ago. Um, and I think Hobe's only gotten more expensive or, you know, has increased in value. One, because it was, he is, ooh, I like those. Look at those. Um, because he used real sterling on some things. Pink and white faux pearls with molded green glass. Okay. I would wear those. I don't think I wear it. Well, maybe I would. And that's, that's 105 to 160. So I would go on the high end of these now for him. Let's see. Coro and Coro craft. And let's see. I don't know much about Coro. I love their stuff. I just don't know much about them. 
I keep a book, um, a notebook of ads. So like on Pinterest or if I find ads that I like, I scan them or keep them. And then I go at my husband's suggestion and have them printed out at Staples or wherever on nice paper. And then I keep them in a book so I can look through them. Um, the nice thing about ads, I'll show you. One, you, you see, well, you can see how it was worn. So this was worn originally as a dress thing. So a going out piece, um, not a daily piece. Um, that doesn't mean that it wasn't intended to be daily also, but that's how they intended it. The other thing is they might list prices on the ads. They might list where it was available and the designer. So you, you can learn other things from it. Um, so I do, I love those. And I have that notebook and I do, it's a, it's like, so it's like this book, only it's full of these in on a three ring binder. And, um, I do. I love that. So one thing to know, uh, that's what I was trying to let you know is that Coro and Coro Craft are together and the Coro mark was used in 1919. Oh God, this is probably boring you guys, but I'm sorry. Um, I won't be on too much longer. Okay, here we go. They patented the interlocking catch mechanism for Coro duets. Du Coro du duets are um, what they are famous for, are their duets. Um, I do not have one, but I have seen them. I wasn't real interested in them collecting, so I didn't. Coro craft, two words and then one word later, started in 1937, and that was for their top end designs. So. They had A, B, and C, it, like others, or maybe they just had high, low. And the high, the high was the Coro Craft, and the low, or the average, was um, Coro. Then they did Vendome, Vendome Mark, and that's the full up-to-market Vendome line in 1953. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, those are more retail pieces. The Vendome, Ven I don't know if that's how you say it. Um, and then, um, let's see, in 79, Coro, Coro Craft was closed, except for in Canada, where they, they started until the mid-90s. So, they're no longer in production. And I don't know if you guys know, <laughs> this is just what you wanted, a history lesson. But um, Liz Claiborne was having problems in the late 90s and early 2000s. And the reason they started having um, cash flow problems wasn't because she wasn't selling or any of that. It was because they started buying things up. So they bought like, I don't know, uh, they, they bought up several places. And so a, a lot of these things that we buy now are actually whole, a whole own, wholly owned subsidiary, I think is the legal term for them of Liz Claiborne. <clears throat> so they're all under direction of Liz now, which is kind of sad because you don't have the individuality of those pieces. Plus, um, all the makers out of Providence, Rhode Island, which is where a lot of the American costume pieces were made, um, if not all, uh, until the 90s um, are closed now. This is Christian Dior. Just beautiful pieces. I'm a pearl collector, so I would, of course, do that. This is one of my favorites by him. I've always loved this piece. I don't know much about it. It's from the 50s, it says. So, plum glass cabochon on prong set faux pearls. Um, here's the good, better, best. So, the good, the better, and then the best. Actually, the better is my favorite. And so, I think it's more like normal housewives of the 50s. Going out jewelry for the 50s. And then daily jewelry for the stars or upper class. And then the rich and famous and going out jewelry, specialty jewelry is there. You have to remember, too, that in the 50s, well, even the 40s, costume jewelry was 
precious. Um, they used great coatings. That's why a lot of your Monet, Trafari, Coro, well, Chanel, and any of those, any of the good names you find are, um, Ooh, look at that Middle Eastern one. That's based off a of Middle Eastern design, a shoulder cuff necklace. And then, of course, the Oriental influence. But, um, any, as I was saying, I'm sorry, the plating was so much better than it is now. And then, if you go back to, like, the 1900s, the 1800s, late 1800s, to about the 20s, you can find silver that has been washed in gold or French gold, which is sterling and gold combined. Oh, I kind of like this. They do good, better, best at everybody. These are Chanel. Uh, okay, I say that and then I didn't look. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, Chanel. Okay. Yes, these are definitely Chanel. Out of these, honestly, I think the better is my favorite. I don't, honestly, I don't like the design of the best. I think this is too much right here and here. That's my opinion, of course. It's Chanel. Like, I can redesign her. So, but then the Maltese Cross I love. I will all... These right here are on my wish list for Chanel. These are unsigned, though. And they are from the 20s. I've seen these many times at auctions. And I've never been able to get them at a reasonable price. I shouldn't say many. Maybe five times. And I would so love to have that. Look at that little frog. He's rare. Green and black with red enamel lead casting. Oh, he's a lead one. So, Chanel. <coughs> oh, they even talk about it here. In the 20s and 30, early 30s, they went to using cast lead with the rhinestones. Mostly creature pins and a few novelties. Um, they were made in France, but were actually... Of American manufacture. The enameling rhinestone off the Pave set are invariably of high quality. All too rare nowadays, but these pins change hands for considerable sums. So the enameled lead is awesome. Don't lick it. If you don't lick it or you're not wearing it directly against your skin where you're sweating and getting the lead in you, it's not going to hurt you. But, um, I would guess that your... Oh, I love those. Those go with those pins we just saw. Okay, here's one of my dream pieces. Just a lovely single faux pearl strand. And actually, it said in here... 130 to 190. Oh, these are from the 80s. I'm an 80s girl. I was 10 to 20 in the 80s. And would have worn those in a second. In a heartbeat. So... I'm sure you guys know most of this, but I will go over it because, well, Coco Chanel. In 80, 1883, she was born in France. In 1909, she began designing hats, and that is how she got her start. There she is. There she is with hats. And I actually used to wear hats in high school and middle school um, that I could find um, for my grandma and my great grandma and those kinds of things. Um, in the little towns around where I grew up. She opened a house of couture in Paris and then two other places that you don't want me to pronounce in French in 14, 1914 to 16. And then her famed Chanel number no. five perfume was 1923. And my mom did wear that. And then she worked with movie producers in Hollywood starting in 31. And of course, styled and designed for there she is the beautiful woman she styled and designed for specifically Catherine Hepburn Grace Kelly Elizabeth Taylor she dressed them and made so by dressing them it wasn't only just for Chanel anyway it wasn't just her um, jewelry Chanel's head to toe designer so she she would make costumes for them and everything um, in 1939, she loses her fashion house because of World War II um, and the Nazis. She got, she got, she was exiled to Switzerland for her love affair with 
an English or a Nazi officer in 1945. And if you haven't read her book, you might want to. You learn different things. And um, my mom's a teacher, was a teacher when she was alive. And she wasn't real thrilled that I was, I loved Coco because of Coco's supposed ties to the Nazis. As I understand it, could be true, could be false, and I won't say, you know, she she did fall in love and have an affair with a Nazi officer in France, in Paris specifically. A lot of them moved from their homes into um, hotels, like boarding homes, only they were hotels. And the Nazi generals and the Nazi officers then lived there too. And so they were all commingling, whether um, the... Frenchmen, French women, like like the the ideology of the Nazis, didn't matter. They had to stay safe, and she fell in love and had an affair with this gentleman. I think she had several affairs over the years, but um, I've heard she spied for the Americans and spied for the English and French governments. Um, using the, her connections by living in that um, hotel and having her affair. But <clears throat> they still, after World War II, still, as I said, exiled her. Um, she did her comeback reopening of her salon um, in 1954. Robert Goosen became the chief designer for Chanel in 1960. Chanel um, did die in 1971 at the age of 88 in Paris. And then in 1983, I remember when this happened, Karl Lagerfelder, Lagerfeld became the director of the House of Chanel. Oh boy, was that a day. I remember that. Um, I read Seventeen Magazine. I had a subscription of that from the time I was 12 until I was 18 and moved out. But um, so it was on there. It was on Vogue. It was everywhere. So I love that. Um, there's one of the pieces I would love to have. And that is a um, floral motif in the original brown paper covering cardboard Chanel box lined with the original t tissue paper. And see how it's round where the earrings are? I don't know why they did the round things. Monet, I have a, I have a Monet, a Sarah and Coventry, and I think I have a Trafari that all are in their originals, and they come in round boxes like that. I don't really know why. Excuse me. Um, original boxes. Let me put you back on something pretty here. How about some cloisonne? Chanel Joy was and still is sold in a pack, packaged box bearing, of course, her name, or of course, the company name Chanel. The individual piece of um, purrs and demi purrs, oh gosh, I don't know, are, are all separately boxed. Early Chanel jewelry comes back on market. It usually does so without its original boxes. If the pieces still have its box, the value of jewelry can be increased by up to 30%. And that goes for anything. If you have the original boxes, the original paperwork, um, so you can show its original provenance, of any piece from a piece of clothing to shoes to bags to jewelry of course then oh furniture you increase its value toys all of that so it's always a good thing to keep that but don't do it in disregard of using it <laughs> on the cutting edge there you go look at that ring it is let's see in silver and blue and red nylon, circa 2002. <laughs> there we go, something with some earrings. These are Zulu earplugs made from wood and purse spec with chrome studs from the 1960s. Wow. And we think earplugs are new. <laughs> That's cool, those are from the 60s. I would not put those in my ear, but I wouldn't mind having them as a collection. Maybe it'd be fun to have a whole whole thing of those lined up and then in like a shadow box on your wall. Let's see what this is. Beaded necklaces with alternating smooth black and carved red composite beads from the 1970s. It's made to look like cinnabar. 
from the Orient. And it, so, and it has the barrel type clasp here. Maybe a pearl clasp, I can't tell. Oh no, that's a pearl clasp, sorry. I couldn't tell by looking at it that way. Um, let's see. Multicolor glass beads with pale, blah, 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 and coffee glass beads. Um, from the 30s. So that's this one right here. I'll go sideways so you can see it. That's that one. Pretty, huh? And it's worth 60 to 100. The Murano glass. Murano glass has been popular forever. This one's from the 1920s. So we see, often see these beads and they do currently make kind of beads like that, but they also have old ones. So the glories of glass is what this is called. Let's see, fluid and sculpture, the Egyptian revival, it talks about in this book. Ooh, just lovely things. Oh, and I like this. It talks about the different styles that developed in America. So let me see. I'll do one more. Is this Carol? Oh, here. Oh, this is good. This has three on it. So we'll go through all three. This is Carol Lee. I love that star. Um, that's from 1950s, embossed with studs, it's three inches, uh, 75 to 100 for that. And I'd say it's still probably worth about that. Crystal bracelets from the 80s, 165 to 170, that's stapled. Um, Carol Lee isn't the big name. Um, they had a line in the 80s when I was a kid called the Duchess of Windsor, and that's very highly collectible. But other than that, it was just a costume company that was started. Let's see what it says. American company Carol Lee was founded in 1972 and is still creating high, creating classic high quality jewelry. Most pieces are made of sterling, sometimes gold plate with faux or cultured pearls, rhinestones. So there you go. Pearls, both faux and cultured play a key role in her designs that's from the 90s and it's worth 25 to 35 that's exactly what it's worth now it's pretty though i like pearl i collect pearl things so you're gonna i will always think they're pretty and i can't i think my mom had a duchess of windsor piece i don't know when she passed away i don't think who knows if we even had it then still <laughs> She had a lot of just costume jewelry that neither my sister or I kept. Flower pin of gold plate casting, green pave set with green and pave set Claire Swarovskis in the mid 60s. So when you're selling, this is a signer. When you're selling or reselling or collecting, if you can find out the crystals are not glass or just normal crystals, but Swarovski, it increases your value 10 to 25% probably. So let's just say like 18% increase. If you can say that the brooch or whatever piece you have is Swarovski, because Swarovski is the highest quality of cut crystal there is. Someday, if you're interested, I could give you a little lesson on Swarovski crystal. <laughs> um, when I had a bead and jewelry store, I had a um, Swarovski um, associate, or I'm not sure, they came by to sell to my store. And so I got to learn quite a bit about them. It was kind of interesting. I love these white metal earrings, the Nevet clear cut. Um, the Nevet cut is um, the diamond, elongated diamond shape you see there. And there, there's a middle crossing and then the cuts go irradiate from the or irradiate radiate from the center so it's not um it doesn't have a flat table on it like a marquee cut does and then signer i don't know much about signer that's a beautiful piece though i would be happy to have that piece and then we'll look i'll have you down here on these signer was a manufacturing company in 1892 to produce fine jewelry. Since 1931, they manufacture classic upmarket costume jewelry. Signer pieces look like fine jewelry, but are set with rhinestones rather than jewels. Often Swarovski crystals and gold-toned metalwork, early pieces are unmarked. 
Um, after 1945, they're Mark Siner. Okay, I'm going to show you these two down here. Look at them. Aren't they adorable? A cow and a dog pin. Small turquoise glass cabochons and larger ruby eyes from the 50s. <laughs> they're cute. So Siner would be a good one. I just, I don't know that I've seen much of him, him, so. And then we have one more, and then I'm done today with my live Friday. My Friday live from the parking lot. Castle Cliff, founded in New York by Clifford First in 45. So you'll notice a lot of things opened um, right around World War II as it was ending in New York. That's because we had a lot of, obviously, immigrants coming to America. And that is when Providence started to become the hub for making of and manufacturing um, costume jewelry pieces. Castle Cliff made bold but intricate jewelry from good quality materials. So they're not the highest quality, but they are good, it says. Um, imaginative use of stones and styles ranging from Art Deco to Gothic to Native American. Large signed pieces that have stood the test of time are most sought after it doesn't say when they closed or if they're still making it i'd have to do a little more research there i like it. that one's kind of cool that's definitely um native american pen styled of gold plate and metal green enameling and faux green agate from the 60s in the 60s, um, stones were very popular, so that's why he used the faux green anag. And this is from the 50s. That, that's a typical 50s button. And then right here, look at those. Um, Gold-plated Mesoamerican heads and motif, polychrome, semi precious stone beads and drops. Polychrome is the metal, right? And that's from the late 40s. So that's cool. So that was your history lesson via costume jewelry. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, and I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I am um, posting on eBay uh, quite a lot of jewelry right now. But um, if it's on, if I post it on Instagram, it's always cheaper for you guys because I don't have to do quite quite the work to get up the listing and all that, pay the fees. So I'd love to sell it that way. If you're looking for something specific, let me know. I have um, tons of vintage. I love vintage jewelry. So anything before ninety, um, about ninety five is considered vintage. 92 to 95 and then anything after that is um current costume or fashion jewelry and i do have some of that um i i do a lot of that in my bags and i'm gonna have about 10 bags out that are curated specifically so i'm gonna have pearls gold tone plated type jewelry silver tone silver plate um, I have one that's all full of wonderful plastics and acrylics. It's an awesome bag. They all range of, um, they're all in quart bags and I sell them for, um, whatever price I give you, I sell them for that and that includes the shipping. And so I will put them up this weekend on Instagram and also on eBay. And they're good. They have, um... They do have some pieces that aren't awesome. Then they have some pieces that need new um, class for jump rings. And then some of the pieces are beautiful and can be worn immediately. And they, um, they even have some that are signed. So would I love to have this? Yes, I believe it's a trifari. It doesn't say on here, but I think it's a trifari pen. Um, and I would, um, if you want anything specific, bracelets, necklaces, earrings, you want gold, silver, 
um, sterling plated. Um, what else do I have? I do. I have rings, earrings, and I can make you. I'd be happy to make you a grab bag of all that stuff and whatever quality. And you can give me a price range, and I can even cater it towards what you need. So, um, if you need anything, I'm at designs and doovers at gmail.com. It's all one word. And other than that, have a great week, Friday afternoon and evening and have a great weekend. I'll talk to you guys soon. Um, look for me in the feed, Kristen with designs and doovers.